true. Uh, one of the questions that we got as well from our uh, members is regards to letters, uh, cover letters to agents and publishers. And we were wondering if you yeah. have any advice on constructing those because a lot of our members are looking at submitting or seeking representation. And one of the specific questions was, well, does it matter how you address it? <laughs> this is a whole module in, in a course I teach. Um, so I'll, I'll try to really condense it. There's a difference between a cover letter and a, and a pitch letter. Mm -hmm. So if you're pitching something, if you've been asked to pitch something, then that's, that's a copywriting task. You're trying to sell your manuscript or whatever. But a cover letter is simply a cover letter. And most editors are just trying to get to the actual writing. Mm -hmm. So one of my pieces of advice is to say, you know, dear editor, uh, here is my manuscript. It's this many pages or words long. Uh, here is my one sentence brief bio. Thank you very much. Signed. Um, I had a, had a teacher in a literature teacher in high school and he used to be holding, you know, the guide to English literature in his hand and we wouldn't be paying enough attention. And he'd say, you know, listen up, this is literature, you know, this is not hot lead on the bar X by Cactus Pete. So my sample cover letter is always, you know, dear editor, please find attached my novel hot lead on the bar X by Cactus, as by Cactus Pete. Um, it is based on my 30 years as a working cowboy in Southern Alberta. Uh, this is my first novel, but I've had pub poetry published in the Cowboy Poets Annual, uh, Home on the Range, and uh, uh, Cowboy Poets Forever. Signed, you know, real name, brackets, Cactus Pete. That's all you need to say. It's got the name of your manuscript. It's got a tiny little biography. It's got your writing credits, if any. Um, Thing that most people put in their cover letters that I that I say just you have to excise is never apologize never explain don't apologize for being a new writer don't say please send you know if you if you uh, reject my work please send me some bits of advice um, never explain how the work got written um, if you've done your job, you've looked at the guidelines and you know what the publisher wants and you know that your piece of work fits in that. So you don't have to apologize for that, nor do you have to tell the story. I, mean, I remember getting submissions, especially when I was a magazine editor, getting uh, poetry submissions for this magazine we were working on. And cover letter would be longer than the submission <laughs> and it, if the submission was four poems the cover letter explained how each one was written and what each line of each one meant in one particular rather rather excruciating case and i mean excruciating because i felt embarrassed for the writer not not because it was i mean not just because it was hard to read that your writing speak for itself and no matter how inexperienced you are, it's not really their business. Either your writing is good enough for their venue or it's not. Mm -hmm. The other thing, I, I know that some editors like something that really personalizes the letter or gets kind of a chatty tone. But over the years, I've discovered that can backfire more than it, than it helps. I, my, uh, my worst cover letter when we were at the Books Collective was... Know, Dear Candace Jane Dorsey, I am looking for someone who has the cojones to publish this book. Mm -hmm. Well, right away I failed the physical, right? I mean, it was never going to, I'm never going to have the cojones. And yet, there it is. And then he, he went on to say, you know, it's something that's never been done before, better than Bradbury, Heinlein, and Asimov, and, and never done before Arctic science fiction. So by chatting to me, he let me know that he knew nothing about his field. And that he stopped reading in 1947 or 57, and and that he was lumping science fiction and fantasy writers together, and so on. Every single sentence in this cover letter made me less inclined 
to read the actual writing. But because we were really good at the Books Collective, we did read actual writing, and we actually sent, sent, we tried at first anyway, to send back letters that actually talked about the writing and said why we were, we were refusing. Uh, but he was one of the reasons why we stopped doing that, because I sent him back a response, and part of it was, don't ever write a cover letter like that again, because it, it ran the risk of alienating enabling the editor before they even read, read your work and and he sent me back a, a letter saying that I was clearly raised wrong by my parents and, and really should be dead so I considered that a bit of a death threat and, hmm. and uh, I thought you know okay well I guess that's why presses send letters that say your work does not meet our needs at this time but the, the point was that you know his work wasn't any worse than a lot of the other bad writing that we were getting, but his cover letter predisposed us against him from the start. So never apologize, never explain, say only what the cover letter needs to say to keep track of the submission and to give them a very, very brief idea of who's sending it. And if if the submission guidelines say send a bio, as well as, you know, like cover letter, bio, and submission, say, then your bio does that and you don't have to put it in your letter. So it's better to not make an impression in the cover letter, to have a completely neutral cover letter and make an impression with your writing than it is to put someone off because you don't know the editor. And I also say to people, the editor's not going to, is not in it to be your friend and they're not in it to be your writing teacher. They have a job to do and their job is to choose excellent writing for whatever they're editing. And that's their only job. So we shouldn't ask them to do other jobs because they'll be doing those other jobs on their own time and on, on their own stuff. So send me send, send me feedback on my writing. Not going to help it for 90%, 95% of what you send out. It doesn't mean your work is crap if it gets rejected. It just means it's not the editor's job to tell you anything about why or what you could do to make your work better. You find that somewhere else by yourself. You take writing classes, you have a peer writing group, you work at that by yourself. That's really valuable information. Taking that one, putting it in, in the back of my brain as I write uh, to a number of editors and have said way too much, I now realize. Um, so you've written in a diversity of genres and we're kind of wondering how you approach each different area. Is there, do you have different routines and different rhythms for what you're writing? Or is it all just kind of writing? Uh, no, yes, no, yes. I, <laughs> many answers. Um, in general, it's all kind of writing. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I don't even really know what's coming, what's coming along. I'll get a voice that says something and it will turn into something longer and then it'll turn into a story or a book or something. And I won't really know why that initial prompt in essence happened to me. I mean, I'm not, I don't write from prompts. I sort of self prompt. I'll write, a, uh, I'll hear something or I'll get an idea and I'll start typing and it will, it will become clear whether that has potential to keep going. And also I'll keep going. Um, I think when you've read a lot of different genres, you think of all of that as as your toolkit. Mm -hmm. So if like people who love fantasy and only read fantasy and write fantasy, it's pretty it's pretty a logical uh, extension of their reading <clears throat> into their writing, and they're going to know a lot of the fantasy tropes. But say you write fa you read fantasy and you also read mystery, and you end up writing a fantasy that has a mystery in it or has a problem to be solved. You have a, a toolkit that goes across two genres. So maybe at a certain point, you'll get more interested in in the, the problem, the mystery, than you are in the fantasy element. You know, so stories come out in different voices and they come out differently. For me, it's quite unplanned um, and sometimes almost unconscious. But uh, 
I think that to get something into print, even if even if on the surface a writer has poor self esteem or lots of hesitancy or or bad social conditioning, um, somewhere in there is a little streak of ego, and the ego says, "Okay, I wrote this, therefore it must be important for some reason." Now Robert McKee in his book Story, which is a, a marvelous book, I think writers should read, even though it's about screenwriting, novelists and, and short story writers can benefit just as much. And uh, and he says at one point, theme is the writerly perspective on the significance of the story. And I just had cause to quote that yesterday to someone, which is why it's fresh in my mind. But what it really means is um, you write what you write and it's important because you thought it was important to write. And, and it has unity because you have a certain attitude about the material. So you really don't always have to worry about whether you're getting a theme into your work or whether you're you're following any of these big analytical principles that, that um, cr critics and teachers use to analyze books. What you just have to think about instead is why you're telling that story, why you think it's important, and follow the thread of that importance, and, and you end up with, with uh, a coherent, uh, a self-coherent manuscript, if you will. Um, and what that means is that when you type a thing or handwrite a thing, if you're a handwriting first draft person, you have to have enough confidence in it that you don't throw it out. And as long as it stays there, you must have had a reason. And so sometimes you may not even ask yourself the reason, you just have to have confidence that you have the reason and keep typing. Other times you might actually say, my goodness, where did this come from and why, why is it part of the story I'm writing or or what does this say about what I need to write about? And some people will, will thoroughly examine that, sometimes in their notebooks or just, you know, while they're lying in the bathtub and and they will they will find answers. But sometimes it's better to just keep typing. This is something that I was a student of W. O. Mitchell's, and, and he had what he called Mitchell's messy method, and he basically said you should just type every day for a lengthy period of time, and it doesn't matter what you're writing about because gradually it will all self cohere, and you'll find that you're typing about mostly about one thing, but you should never stop the actual act of, of typing every day, and. Um, and his classes consisted, we, we'd hand in these sheets of stuff that were our week's worth of typing. And his classes consisted of highlighting a line or two lines or five lines that had that he, that he felt had life. And then he would read them out loud. He'd say, listen to this, this really has life. <laughs> and, and the idea being that we were supposed to learn to filter that out of our own work and to follow those parts that had life. Um, now, I was a bad typist, so I didn't take his advice perfectly. Um, and I don't necessarily write every day, but um, when I do write, I consider, I guess my ego gets in there and says, well, you must have been doing that for a reason, so get on with it, and I just keep, keep typing. Um, we all have to examine our writing process, you know, find out what it really is and, and, um, and how to help ourselves write, like get out of our own way. So it's going to be different for different people. That's not certainly how I do it. That means if it turns out to be have fantastic elements in the end, or have mystery elements, or have science fictional elements, they're just used as tools to crack open the character development and the and the action. And and um, it was actually a great um, trauma to me and a great struggle when I discovered that I had to shoehorn my work into various genres and. I still resist it, I think, on, on many levels. I still resist it. It's very interesting. It, everything you've said kind of ties into this. But do you have any advice for our young, younger writers or aspiring writers? It's kind of a right. cliche question. But... Don't think about writing. No, I mean, you know, I, I, it sounds really obvious and kind of cliche, but I'm, I'm very fond of some books by Natalie Goldberg on, on writing called Wild Mind and Writing Down the Bones. And she she was a Zen practitioner and, and her Roshi told her that um, 
her instead of sitting in zazen and meditating her, her practice her zen practice needed to be writing so she came around to the zendo one day and he and he said Natalie have you been writing and she said well no but I've been thinking a lot about writing and he said Natalie thinking is thinking writing is writing and you know that really struck me because if you have nothing but the blank screen or the blank page and you aren't actually writing nothing about that says you have to write well you just have to write and once you've written you have something to work with whereas if you've written nothing all you have is aspirations i mean i've been i've been asked by people at writing conferences oh i have this great idea for a book what do i need to do to get it published and they always hate the answer and the answer you need to write it you can't you can't just shop around an idea especially in the publishing industry these days you have to actually show up and write it down because ideas are are well they're not even a dime a dozen anymore they're like ideas are free they're lying all over the ground um many people are having the same idea as you if you don't write it what have you got you've got you've got nothing but a sort of a, a wistful aspirational look on your face you know write the stuff and if you write badly you can learn to write better and goodness knows i've seen writers who are now in print i've seen their beginnings and i've seen how they started and i know that it's not it's not bad first drafts that define a writer it's the it's how how you're willing to take that material and work on it till it satisfies higher standards um, but if you have nothing on the page you know if you're just looking at this <laughs> then what have you got to what have you got to work with nothing so i remember a, a friend of mine picked up a book and i have no idea what book it was but the first line of the book was a writer is a person who writes and they looked at this and they closed the book and they said okay they put the book aside it's like okay that's enough for today but you know that then became kind of their motto a writer is a person who writes so writing badly is not as bad for a writer as not writing at all because writing badly you can fix but not writing you've got nothing to work with so um that being said, I would also say to aspiring writers, yeah, keep your pen moving or your hand moving or your hand typing or whatever method you use to get stuff written. And I do actually recommend that people carry around notebooks and pens as, as well as typing. Um, but that's a much longer um, discussion than I want to have <laughs> right now. But um, also read a lot. Read a lot in the field you love. And in other fields as well, read books that you really don't expect to teach you anything because it might surprise you that they do. In some of my writing, some of the things I read in my writing classes are from a book by James Clyke called Chaos, which is about the, the origins of chaos science, or chaos theory. Um, but the scientists who were, first of all, the writer wrote the book as if it were like a novel. He wrote it, it he's a beautiful, it was beautiful beautifully written piece. He introduced all the characters who created the science, even though they were real people. He introduced them with stories about their character and then watched the development. And it was it was enthralling. But also, a lot of these scientists looked at the world the way writers do. So if I'd never read that book, I wouldn't have had some of these interesting and, and beautiful um, discussions. Like Feynman, who who was, or Feigenbaum rather, who was like one of the, one of the parents of Geo science, um, talked about how, you know, in the world there are things wondrous, wondrous and strange, and by virtue of your trade you want to understand them. And if that's not a description of writing, <laughs> as well as, as science, I don't know what is. You know? And, and so, so read outside your comfort zone, read people whose ideas you don't know if you agree with or not just read and read and read and read um, and if you can I used to be a little skeptical about writing groups even though I recommend them all the time but having read a bit about Dunning Kruger's research I now am not skeptical because what, what we often don't know when we talk about the Dunning Kruger effect 
which is that effect where people who don't know anything think they know everything about the topic. Um, uh, often, often rendered as people who are stupid think they're smart, but it's not just that. It's people who are ignorant think they're knowledgeable. Um, but what they did in their research is they took the people who, who were the self-proclaimed experts who were actually really bad at the task, and they, and they gave them an hour's coaching on the task they were researching. And after the hour was coaching, they didn't do the task better, but they were better at assessing their own performance. So what we get from writing groups is not necessarily that we write better, it's that we are better at understanding when we're bad. And so if we can do that for each other in writing groups, then it's our individual responsibility to take that writing home and figure out how to make it better. And even our writing group can help us with that sometimes by suggesting or by having people who are a little better in one area than another. Um, and if somebody gives you really challenging negative feedback, listen to it. And if you have to, you know, record it, listen to it again <laughs> later. I mean, some of my writing career would have been a lot improved if I had, if I had actually read rejection letters a little more closely. But I was so bruised as you know in my twenties and thirties by by these rejections that I didn't actually read the letters. I just put them in a filing folder. Then I'd look at the filing folder, you know, sometimes years later, and realize that what I was being told was completely different from rejection. It was like, you need to do this to that story and then submit it again. Did resubmit it because I had not read the letter properly, you know. So listen to your negative feedback, and also because we're also inclined to listen to negatives more than positives, listen to your positive feedback and try and figure out not just oh it's a compliment, but what does it tell me about what I'm doing right? Be really analytical with your own work. How is it? How is it that I do that thing right? How is it that I do that thing wrong? Obviously, you want to do more of the thing that makes it feel good to the reader and less of the thing that, 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 that makes it um, opaque and, and, uh, and that prevents them from reading. So, so you know, and, and then the other thing is just, you know, live a long time. <laughs> like, just keep doing this over and over again. Um, again, to, to sort of make a quote from Zen theory, Good book called Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. Um, the uh, and I'm I'm not going to sort of tell the whole story, but Shin, Shinryu Suzuki, who wrote this book, said basically you have to get into the spirit of repetition, and over and over again you have to become bread and put yourself in the oven. So the spirit of repetition is just going back and back to the same thing over again. And why that lesson stuck with me is because he said, if if a, an artist has too much idealism, they have no alternative but to commit suicide, because the distance between what they want to accomplish and what they can accomplish is so great. But it is better not to be so idealistic. It is better simply to put yourself in the oven, like to, to become bread and put yourself in the oven over and over again. And of course, as I, he was now describing me and my dark, dark nights of the soul, saying, oh my God, I can't do this, I must, I'm awful, I can't do this. And, and I just, when I read that, I actually laughed. It wasn't, it, it was because it was so much a description of the way we talk to ourselves. Well, if I can't do this perfectly, then obviously I'm a failure and I can't do it at all, which is so nonsense. You just have to do it over and over again and not, not judge that's not the right word. Not condemn your process. Yeah, you do have to judge. You do have to say to yourself, is this better? Is this worse? Do the things better. But to condemn yourself for not being perfect at the very beginning of your of your writing career is is just a recipe for disaster. And sometimes quite literally. You know, people have taken quite remarkable steps because they weren't as good as real good or something, right? Well, you know, the poems they were admiring of Rilke's were written when he was 76 years old. And they were 24 and saying, oh, I'm not perfect, so I need to check out. No, that's not the answer. The answer is 
just keep writing until you're 76 years old and somewhere along the way you will have achieved a level of competence and then a level we hope of mastery but the journey will be fascinating you'll have a lot of fun and you'll write stuff right so wow that gonna have to remember that one too <laughs> well thank you so much we've, i think no, we've taken a lot of your time up and i really appreciate you chatting with me is there anything else that you would like to add or say to the people well you know i can i can talk it's one of the things i can do <laughs> and i can talk about writing a lot because over my career i have a lot so you know i i love answering questions about it but think if there's anything that would be my final statement it would be the one that I just said like just keep writing and and take the journey and you know don't 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 get discouraged and stop if you need to improve because you will improve the more you keep doing you know this is this is the long haul we're all in for I remember that W. Mitchell every time he met me he'd say he had this thing with snuff he was always holding a pinch of snuff that wasn't quite getting snorted you know He'd have his snuffbox. He said, "Kid, you didn't quit. You didn't quit." <laughs> but, um, but that was his. That was his best compliment to me. You know, kid, you didn't quit. So years, years later, um, he was still saying the same thing. And I, one of the, the high points in my life was when I was president of the Writers Guild, and we, and we in well, mostly I. That we invented this thing called the Golden Pen Award, which was uh, sort of for to recognize a writer at the at, at a point in their career where they clearly had a huge effect on on the literary community and on literature and on on the Alberta literary community and on sometimes on upcoming writers and whatever. And, and we gave we gave him he was the first recipient. So I got to dress up in fancy um, red velvet evening gown and, and give an actual golden pen, fountain pen to, to Mitchell, who, who was very, very fun. But I remember that, you know, as part of like, his acceptance, he sort of said, thanks, kid. You didn't quit. I'm glad you didn't quit. But, um, so, you know, it was it was this, this lovely moment where, where I actually got to recognize one of my sort of mentors and people who've been grateful to me. I guess that would be another thing I would say. Find find people who can who can set benchmarks a little bit ahead of you and then just keep trying to reach them. I've got a mug and it's a lovely mug and it says it's no use asking the gods to help you run if you don't intend to run fast. So so think about, you know, Setting, setting goals that are really far ahead that you can then keep your eye on and keep working on um, and maintain your courage and just keep keep going and you will find yourself running faster than you thought in terms of, in terms of metaphor. You know, you'll find yourself going further than you thought. That's not a good inspiration. Wow. <laughs> I, want, I want that printed on a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's why I bought the mug. Lord knows I didn't need any more mugs, but I love that message. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so, so much. We really appreciate it.